Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. We're few in number this morning, but we're mighty. It's good to see all of you. This is just the way things go during the summertime sometimes. But uh, it is good to see all of you here in worship with us this morning, and those of you who are joining us online as well, we welcome you. And as we begin our service, we'll start with hymn 66 in our hymnal here. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. church, but since uh, Sam and Billy and Greg and I, the rest of us, we, we don't qualify anymore, so I guess we're going to move right along, and uh, are there any special prayer requests? Our prayer list, by the way, is on the back of the bulletin right beneath the Apostles' Creed. Good 
Any special prayer requests? Any unspoken needs? Just lift your hands. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, as we come into this space, as we come together from all different walks of life, as your people, as your children, we give thanks for this opportunity. We give thanks, Lord, for the time that we have together this morning in fellowship and in worship. And we pray, Lord Jesus, as you are among us, that you would lift our hearts, that you would encourage us in our minds, that you would strengthen our spirits with a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit to guide and direct our thoughts during this time so that we may truly take in all that you would have us to learn, that we would embrace the truths of your scripture and pray, Lord, that it would take root in our hearts to bear fruit for you in this coming week. Lord Jesus, we are so humbled by the great sacrifice that you made for us on that cross that allows us to experience the forgiveness of sins, the freedom from the guilt, the joy and the peace that can come only from you. And as we prepare our hearts and our spirits to celebrate that in this act of holy communion this morning, let the truth of your love for us fill us with that blessed assurance of our salvation. And Lord, we are mindful of those who are in need around us. We lift them up before you. Pray that you would guide us, Lord, into the ministries that will make the most difference for those around us where we are. Lord, we pray for the sick, and we ask your healing touch to be upon their bodies. We pray for those who are struggling and ask, Lord, that you would help us to be aware and ready to reach out as your people, as your church, as your body, to lift them up, to meet their needs, to offer them encouragement and hope, to embrace them, to love them, Lord, with your love, that they may know the grace that awaits them when they receive you as we have, as their Savior. And Lord, we pray for those this morning who grieve and ask that your holy presence would bring comfort and strength to the hearts and minds of those who have lost the ones that they love. And as we continue to worship now in this time, Lord, let us be open to the, the truths and the wonderful messages of the hymns we sing, of the, the choir special, of the scriptures that are read, that we may not miss anything that you have to share with us today. And as we do that, we lift our voices together now in the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is 37 in the hymnals here. I sing the almighty power of God. <laughs> Moonshine. 
is 574, Thou Art My God. O God, Thou art my God, I seek Thee. My soul thirsts for Thee. My flesh faints for Thee. As in a dry, weary land where no water is. So I've looked upon Thee in the sanctuary, beholding Thy power and glory. Because Thy steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise Thee. So I bless thee as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on thy name. My soul is feasted as with morrow and fat. And my mouth praises thee with joyful lips. When I think of thee upon my bed. And meditate on thee in the watches of the night. For thou hast been my help. And in the shadow of thy wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to thee. Thy right hand upholds me. Please be seated. If the ushers will come forward at this time, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, I pray that we are truly mindful of the many, many ways in which you bless us. And as we bring our tithes and our offerings this morning, I ask that you bless both gift and giver, using all for the work of your kingdom through Jesus' name. Amen.
gospel lesson this morning is not going to be from the sixth chapter of Mark, as your bulletins read, but the fifth. Now, if you'll recall, two Sundays ago, we read the passage where Jesus stilled the storm. And when he stood up in the boat and calmed the storm, it left the disciples terrified. Asking the question, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now I want to continue in this teaching. So beginning with chapter 5, verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him and cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged them earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding near there in mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told him how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when Jesus got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis, all that Jesus had done for him, and all marvel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise Praise be God. God. Please be seated. Well, the disciples are having a rather tough go of it, wouldn't you say? After witnessing that great miracle that showed Jesus' complete authority over nature, over the natural elements. They bring the boat to the shore, scared, confused, and as they climb out of the boat, they are met by this wild man rushing at them from the tombs, yelling and screaming with broken chains hanging from his wrists, and his ankles possessed by demons. I would imagine that probably sort of unsettled the disciples a bit, wouldn't you think? Maybe unnerved them. I would imagine that most of those disciples would have preferred to get back in the boat and get away, right? But Jesus stood there calmly and waited for the man to get there. And as he threw himself on the ground at Jesus' feet, he began 
to worship Jesus. Now let me ask you this. Who was worshiping Jesus at that moment? Think about it, church. I mean, y'all have been reading the Bible all your lives, so you've read this many times. I'm sure you prayed over it and studied it. Who was it that fell down worshiping Jesus? Was it the man or was it the demons? It was the demons. The man had no idea who Jesus was. He'd never seen him in his life. The demons immediately knew who Jesus was. And they fell down and worshipped him. And they cried out to him, you know, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? They knew who Jesus was. You see, Jesus is the complete authority. Even the demons fall at his feet and worship him. Begged him not to torment them. Begged him not to send them out of the region. When he asked their, asked their name, he said the reply was legion. Legion. For we are many. Could you imagine the state of that poor man possessed by so many demons? Out of his mind. Suffering so much. And when Jesus commanded them to come out, they asked him, could we go into the herd of swine? And Jesus, knowing exactly what gave them permission. The swine run, they drown in the sea, and the man stands cleansed in his right mind and healed in front of Jesus. Now the swine herds run, telling everybody they meet on the way what has just happened. And the people hear the ruckus, they come out here, and they, they come down to see what's going on, and they see the demoniac. That's the only thing they know him. This is the demonic. He's clothed. And he's sane. And he's sitting there talking with this Jesus. And so what did they do? They fall down and worship Jesus and thank him, right? They, they run up and shake the man's hand and congratulate him on having been freed. Right? Wrong. They're afraid. They don't know. They don't understand this. They don't understand this at all. And they are afraid. So they immediately start telling Jesus, we want you to leave. Pleading with him, the scriptures tell us, to please leave. Just go. And notice that Jesus doesn't argue. He doesn't say, but I can heal your sick. I can save the lives of your people who are at death's door. I can make your blind see again. I can help the cripple to walk again. I have the truth, the word of God that I'm coming to proclaim. But he doesn't do any of that. They say, please leave. And Jesus gets in the boat. When Jesus is asked to leave, he goes. He's not going to stay where he's not wanted. And he's not going to force himself on anyone. He won't cheapen the saving, holy power of the gospel by promising blessings if they'll just let him stay. Jesus does not beg. This is the Son of God. This is our Redeemer who hung on the cross for us. This is the righteous judge who will return, the scripture said, not meekly as he came the first time but with his sword in his hand. And he's going to judge. They asked Jesus to leave and he left. What a tragedy for them. Think of all they missed out on in hearing God's son proclaim the truth of the gospel message to them and seeing the miracles and, and receiving the blessings he had that he could have given them. And you know, that's what's happened to a large part of America today. We have asked God to please just go away. We've asked him to leave us alone. We told him we didn't want him in our public school system. We told him we didn't want him in the, the public arena. The crosses for Easter have to come down. They can't be on the public places. The uh, manger scenes 
at Christmas time. We can't do any of that. We've asked him to leave from our public life. And what do we have now? Filthy sexual promiscuity. Everywhere. That's taught to the children in school. But the love of God and the salvation of Christ is not and cannot be. You ask Jesus to go and he goes. And even the church is implicit in some of this. Because I know too many churches and too many pastors that decided they know better than Jesus and what he taught us in this scripture. And they decided that it is more important to be politically correct than it is to be morally, scripturally sound. They have chosen to leave the faith and follow the faithless. They've chosen mammon over God. Some of them did it because they could to gain more people in the pews. Some have done it to bring in more money. But that's not the way of the Lord. How true does that scripture ring now? Straight is the gate. And narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And few there will be who enter therein. Jesus does not stay where he is not wanted, where he is not worshipped, and where the people do not listen to his voice. Remember his warning. Do not call me Lord and not do the things I have told you to do. Even in our personal lives, sometimes we, we push Jesus away when he could help us the most, when he could offer us direction and understanding, help that we could not give ourselves. Oh, we want him to take us to heaven when we die, right? We want a crown. We want to walk down those streets of gold. We want to see our mansion. But we do not want Jesus to tell us how to live our lives here and now. It doesn't work that way, church. It doesn't work that way. We don't want to be told that we have to forgive. We don't want the changes that would have to come in our lives to really fall in line with the will of God for us. Why? Because we are just like those people in Gadara who are afraid of what Jesus might ask us to give up, of what he might ask us to pick up of what he might ask us to do. The one who loved you so much, he died in your place. Who offers you cleansing from all your sins. Perfect joy and peace. But we're afraid of it. We don't even want to be told to love our fellow Christians, much less our enemies, right? John 13, 35 sees Jesus telling us what I've said so many times. They will know you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. Now in that passage, he's not even mentioning loving our enemies or loving strangers. He's only talking about loving other Christians. And we have trouble even doing that. Once we get out the doors of the church and we've got those people at that church and them people at that church and those over yon, no, this is the church. We have to be united once we leave our places of worship. Once we've been fed and received the word, if you are led by the Holy Spirit, there's only one. They're led by the same Holy Spirit. All called into the will of God all working together to accomplish his will, not our own. And that's what's wrong with the church. The same thing that, that is wrong with society. We've told Jesus, don't call me, I'll call you. When I need you to come bless what I am doing, I'll, I'll ask for your blessing. When I get in the 
hole I can't dig myself out of, I'll come to you and ask you, you know, then I'm going to need you to bail me out. What will it take for us to surrender our pride and to really humble ourselves at Jesus' feet like this demoniac did so that he can heal us, so he can give us our peace? You see, instead of being like those crowds that rushed out there and asked Jesus to leave, we should be like the crowds in that other passage that walked all the way around the lake to be there when he got to the other side because they wanted to hear more. But even now, church, nothing is hopeless for us. Nothing. Nothing is hopeless for America. Even for the people of good art. They were not left hopeless. Jesus didn't abandon them to their fear. Think. Did he get in the boat and leave? Yes, he did, but he wouldn't let the man who had been healed go with him, would he? What did he tell him to do? He said, you go back and you tell everybody what the Lord has done for you. You are my witness. You are my disciple. You are the one I am sending here in this place at this time. Because while those swine herds were running through the uh, countryside telling everybody, running into town, telling everybody, gathering the whole crowd. Where was the man who had been possessed? He was sitting at Jesus' feet, being taught. Jesus was discipling him and preparing him. And when they asked him to leave, Jesus sent him as his messenger to that place. And later on, when they come back to that area, there are believers because this man went and made disciples. And God hasn't forsaken the people of our time either because God has sent you. He has sent you to go and witness. He has sent you to go and profess to them what God has done for you in your life. The saving grace that has filled you. The forgiveness that has overwhelmed you peace that God has given you in your life. We are to be witnesses of God's grace and mercy and offer words of healing rather than words of hate. And all of this noise that we hear with all of the fear mongering and, and all of the hate speech, we are to be the voices of hope. We are to be the voices of promise. As the church, our witness has to be one of compassion and not judgment. One of hope and not despair or panic. It must be a witness of confidence and assurance in God's providence and love for us. Not of fear. Our witness has to be one of patience and peace, not impatience. Not frustration. It has to be a witness of love and of understanding not of bitterness and hatred. We have to embrace Jesus' call on our lives as fervently as those people of Gadara begged him to leave. And we have to plead with our other brothers and sisters in Christ to remember who they are and who they are called to be and who it is we serve. We have to be the voice of spiritual hope and revival the voice of peace, the hands of generosity, the means by which they experience the mercy and the grace of God. Because, church, we're in the greatest battle of our time. The battle for relevance and survival. How many times have you heard me say that the church is only one generation away from fading into insignificance? If we deny the power that the Holy Spirit offers and refuse to commit to God's will. Jesus' question still rings out. When I return, will I find faith left on earth? We have been called for this moment 
We have been created for this church, and it's time that we act and share a faithful witness through our action and our words to make the difference. Everything that we say, the things that we do must be sanctified and, and motivated by our Lord's command to love one another. We will all stand in judgment one day. We'll give an account for our actions, whether they were motivated by compassion, concern, and love for others, or by foolish pride and self-will. What will your answer be? As the choir sang a while ago, time after time, he has waited before and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. It's time that we stand up, that we accept the call he has placed on our lives, that we embrace the authority and power that has been given to us through the presence of the Holy Spirit poured out on us and go make disciples for Jesus Christ and make a difference in this world and let America know that there is always hope in God. Our closing hymn is 164. O oh, Jesus, I have promised
the saving grace of Jesus Christ, his only Son, our risen Lord and Savior, and the unity, fellowship, and power of the Holy Spirit be and abide with each of you now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.